Hello everyone, this is Larry Tippin, Putnam County Historian. I want to talk a little about the railroads that came through Putnam County. Putnam County is blessed to have four rail lines allowing residents to travel just about anywhere in the country with relative ease. The existence of these railroads was a significant factor in industries locating here and greatly expanded the market opportunities for local grown agricultural goods and manufactured products. Here we study how these railroads came about and the often complex progression of ownership of the rail lines. We have a map from 1895 that shows the rail lines in Putnam County. We'll talk about those a little bit. The first rail line, the farthest to the south, is what's referred to sometimes as the Vandalia or the Pennsylvania line. This was the first rail line in the county running east to west and went through the current and former places of Nicholsonville, Fillmore, Greencastle, Forest Hill City, Greencastle Junction, also known as Limedale, Hamrick Station, and Reelsville. It began as the Terre Haute and Richmond Railroad, then became the Vandalia and later the Pennsylvania. The next railroad that went through was the Monon Rail Line. Some present and former locations on this rail line from north to south include Ashby's Mill, Forest Home, Stumptown at the county line, Rochdale, Carpentersville, Bainbridge, Locust Grove, Cary Junction, Maple Grove or Maple Grove Flag Station, Greencastle, Greencastle Junction, also known as Limedale, Putnamville, Cloverdale, and Oakland. The Big Ford Railroad was the next one. Some present and former locations on this rail line include Malta, Darwin Flag Station, Greencastle, Ocala, and Fern Station. And finally, the fourth was the Indianapolis, Decatur, and Springfield Railroad, more commonly known as the B&O, that ran east and west on the northern part of the county. Communities include Fort Red, Barnard, Wheaton, Rochdale, Raccoon, originally known as Lockridge, Swanksville, and into Park County, missing Russellville by a half mile. The coming of this railroad significantly affected these communities in northern Putnam County. So let's talk about these railroads, the Vandalian and Pennsylvania Railroad. Terre Haute Industrialist Chauncey Rose wanted to secure a rail line from Indianapolis to Terre Haute. The Terre Haute and Richmond Railroad was chartered in January of 1847. Construction began in late 1849, and by 1852, 73 miles of track had been laid, including the section from Indianapolis to Terre Haute. The, uh, Part of the stretch that went through Putnam County reached Greencastle on February 18, 1852. On March 6, 1865, the name was changed to the Terre Haute and Indianapolis Railroad. On April 26, 1870, an unfinished sex extension was finished from Terre Haute to Illinois State Line that met up with the St. Louis, Vandalia, and Terre Haute Line. So we commonly refer to this line as the Vandalia. It became the Pennsylvania Railroad, which merged with the New York Central to become Penn Central. In 1976, it became part of Conrail. Sections of this railroad in Indiana survived as part of the CSX transportation system, but not the part in Putnam County. Veterans Memorial Highway was constructed on part of the abandoned rail line on the south side of Greencastle. The Monon, it began in southern Indiana in 1847 as the New Albany and Salem Railroad Company, with James Brooks as president. Industrialist Orton C. D. Paw of Salem, Indiana, was another founder, and that name should sound familiar. That rail line was completed from New Albany to Salem in 1849. The New Albany and Southern acquired the existing Northern Rail Line in the early 1850s with intent of connecting New Albany to Michigan City. The Northern section was completed from Michigan City going southwards through Lafayette, Crawfordsville, and then came to Bainbridge by the end of 1853. Then to Greencastle by March 17, 1854. The southern section was extended north from Salem through Bloomington and Gosport, and the last 10 miles of this track were completed in southern Putnam County soon after. The entire length of the line from New Albany to Michigan City was formally dedicated in a grand ceremony at New Albany on July 4th, 1854, officially linking the Great Lakes to the Ohio River. There's a historical marker at New Albany noting 
importance of the rail line as part of the Underground Railroad. This marker reads in part, New Albany and Salem Railroad, the Monon, railroads organized 1847 after years of legislation to provide transportation to move goods and people to and from the state's interior. Completed to Michigan City in 1854 and the last rail was laid in Putnam County. The backside talks about what was called or referred to as the fugitive slaves who used this railroad and escaped. We often refer to the home of Eli Lilly's parents in Greencastle and the Senate McGann House in Rochdale stops on the Underground Railroad. But it's much more logical the fugitive slaves, as they were called, to travel under the cover of darkness along a well-defined path such as the Monon Railroad, relying on the kindness of strangers in their travels. We have heard whispers of the Hillis family who lived near Maple Grove Flag Station at Cary Junction, south of Bainbridge near the Monon, providing shelter and lodging to the travelers. By 1858, the overextended and struggling New Albany and Salem Railroad reverted to the investors who in October of 1859 reorganized and renamed it the Louisville, New Albany and Chicago Railroad. On July 1st, 1897, the LNA&C was formally reorganized as Chicago, Indianapolis and Louisville Railroad. By the early 1900s, the rail line became to be informally known as the Monon, thanks in part to the famous football rivalry between DePaul University and Wabash College that began in 1890, is often referred to as the longest running rivalry, uh, second longest running rivalry west of Alleghenies. In 1832, the 300 pound Monon bow was first presented as a trophy of this annual football matchup. The bow came from a locomotive that previously traveled the 27 miles from Greencastle to Croppersville, linking the two schools. We have a photo of the Monon Bell, courtesy of an article in the Banner Graphic on November 18, 2018, that shows uh, the bell along the rail line. The winning school obtains possession of the coveted Monon Bell for one year. Many interesting stories have been told about students from the school not in possession of the bell seeking to spirit the prize trophy from the other school, sometimes with hilarious results. The most noteworthy of these heists occurred in 1965 in what some have referred to as Operation for Helos. A Wabash student met with the Paul University president claiming to be a representative of the United States Information Services in Mexico City, the student convinced the DePaul president to offer two scholarships to Mexican students and asked to photograph the famous Monon Bell, which was in DePaul's possession after a thrilling one-point victory the previous year, 1964. The dean was understandably reluctant to disclose the location of the bell, but since he thought the visiting student was legitimate, he did show him the prize coveted prize. The dean of the college was the only person on campus who knew the location of the bell which was stored with athletic equipment near DePaul's Blackstock Stadium. The bell, of course, was then spirited away by a group of Wasbash students a few days later. The bell was eventually found by the Wasbash administration who returned it to DePaul University the day prior to the 1965 game. During the game, Wabash students cheered Olay after every Wabash touchdown. At the end of the game, which Wabash won, the Wabash fans were said to have stormed the field. Some were wearing sombreros and ponchos, throwing tortillos into the field and holding up signs and posters congratulating the Paul president for the loss of the two scholarship offers and the Monon Bell. On several occasions, students from the school in possession of the bell sold the trophy themselves in order to conceal the location of the bell more carefully. One such instance was in 1967 when DePaul students removed the bell from its secure location at Bowman Gymnasium, which was the basketball gymnasium 
a week after the previous year's game and buried it behind the north end zone of DePaul's Black Sox Stadium. The bell was dug up from its hiding place during the third quarter of the 1967 game and made a few laps around the football field before the end of the game, which was won by Wabash. Another time, DePaul students attempted to steal the bell from Wabash. They were successful in doing so, loading the bell into their car, but then the car would not start and the students were caught red-handed. In 1941, the bell was swiped from the Wabash campus and was located at the entrance of Jordan Hall on the Butler University campus in Indianapolis. In 2012, DePaul students almost saw the bell from several members of the Wabash fraternity, Sigma Chi, who fell asleep guarding the bell. The Wabash students were roused from their slumber when the DePaul students accidentally rang the bell. As noted in an article with Banner Graphic on October 24, 2017, four Wabash students, including the team's place kicker, dressed in white coveralls and wearing masks, unbolted the Monon Bell from its secure display stand at the Lilly Center on the DePaul campus prior to the game. Since the school was on fall break, police were suspicious of a pickup truck, which was parked outside the Lilly Center for several hours. The Wabash students were also not aware of the bell was secured to the motion sensitive sensors, and as soon as the prize bell was moved, an alarm was sounded at DePaul dispatch, and the local uh, police were waiting for the culprits to exit the building with the bell in tow on a furniture dolly. When apprehended, the Wa Wabash students offered that stealing the bell was part of the rivalry and should go unpunished. The courts thought otherwise, and the would be burglars were charged with criminal trespass had sentenced the community service of help in the cleanup of the refuse left behind by the estimated 8,500 spectators at DePaul Stadium in Greencastle after the November 11th game. On January 11, 1956, the CINL officially adopted the longtime nickname Monon as its corpus title. Vandalia and Monon and Railroads cast just south of Greencastle. Fittingly, this location can be known as the Greencastle Junction, was laid out and platted on that, by that name in 1864 by William and Emily Stieg. The intersection of two railroads, the Stieg family erected a hotel called the Junction House. For a time, the community retained the Greencastle Junction name, although with a Limedale post office. We now simply know the place as Limedale. Several major businesses located on the south side of Greencastle due to the abundance of national resources and the fact the two major rail lines went through Greencastle. The Cole brothers of Mount Pleasant, Iowa, selected Greencastle for their pump and lightning rod factory, which came through in 1863. And then the Greencastle Nail and Wire Company is also a major early manufacturer in Greencastle starting in 1869. Both were located just south of Vandalia or Pennsylvania Railroad on the south side of Greencastle in the area where the county jail is now located. The Big Four Railroad, running parallel to and north of the Vandalia on is the Big Four Railroad. It may seem a bit odd to have two rail lines close to each other that serve essentially the same destinations. The story of the Big Four coming through Indiana highlights the opportunities and greed of railroad investors, as well as the complexity of the mergers, consolidations, and name changes as the railroads evolved to become the major transportation mode in the 1800s. Spanning the state of Illinois from east to west, the St. Louis, Alton, and Terre Haute Railroad was chartered in February 18, 1861 from the predecessor of the Terre Haute and Alton Railroad Company, chartered in 1851. By 1867, the St. Louis, Alton, and Terre Haute line, which ran from St. Louis to Terre Haute, was in poor condition. The company hoped to upgrade its existing line and construct new lines to connect Terre Haute to Indianapolis, but the company was struggling and not able to do so. On September 12, 1867, the St. Louis, Alton, and Terre Haute was effectively transferred to what appears to have been a receivership or holding company called it the Eastern Consolidation. The Indianapolis and St. Louis Railroad filed articles of association with the Indiana Secretary of State on August 31, 1867, and became a corporation in the state of Illinois 
on March 19, 1869. The company was constructed, then constructed new rail lines between Terre Haute and Indianapolis. The Terre Haute Richmond Railroad was involved in early discussions, which were also known as Vandalia, and consideration had been given to using existing lines of that railroad for the new Indianapolis and St. Louis line, but the parties could not reach agreement. As a result, an entirely new rear line was surveyed and track was laid to connect Terre Haute to Indianapolis, generally parallel to, and in some cases, just a few miles from the existing Terre Haute and Richmond line, which became the Vandalia and later the Pennsylvania. The new Indianapolis and St. Louis line came through Putnam County in 1870. The first passenger train from the west reached Greencastle 11 and 10, 10.53 a.m. on Monday, July 11th, and was greeted by a large assembly of citizens at the North Depot, accompanied by salutes from Fred Weeks' artillery. We have a, code, a photo courtesy of Putnam County Public Library from Ira Nichols' files of an unidentified train possibly running on the Big Four near Greencastle. The Indianapolis Decatur and Springfield Railroad. The Indianapolis Decatur and Springfield Railroad was organized in September of 1875. One of its founders and directors was Judge Addison Locke Roach of Indianapolis. The new rail line was laid from east to west with construction reaching Putnam County at Fort Red in April of 1879. Trains began running on February 9, 1880. The railroad continued west through Wheaton, Rochdale, Raccoon, originally known as Lockridge, Swanksville, and into Park County, missing Russville by half mile. The arrival of this railroad significantly impacted those northern Putnam County locations. The most important landowner in Fort Red at that time was Calvin Barnard. The new railroad took large portions of his land north of Fort Red, missing that community by a quarter mile to the north. The new railroad erected a station and named it Barnard Station in Calvin Barnard's honor. Barnard platted a town he named after himself on the north side of the railroad at Barnard Station on July 29, 1881. The community had a post office, which had been called Fort Red from March of 1860, 1876 until it was renamed Barnard on March 29, 1880. It also came to be known as Barnard, which is what we call the tiny unincorporated, unincorporated community, extreme northeast Putnam County today. Before 1880, Rochester had only a small number of scattered homes, but soon became a major boom town with the construction of the Indianapolis, Decatur, and Springfield Railroad, which came through town on February 9, 1880. It intersected the existing Louisville, New Albany, and Chicago Railroad and the community where these two rails cross was named an honor of Judge Addison Locke Roach. A native of Tennessee and a graduate of Indiana University, Roach studied law in Rockville in the 1840s and was elected to the state legislature in 1847. He then served as a circuit court judge in Marion County and later as judge on the Indiana Supreme Court, a position he held from January 3rd 1853 to May 8, 1854. He then returned to private law practice in Indianapolis. Rochdale, initially two different words, was plotted by Elijah and Nancy Grantham on October 30, 1879. The town wasted no time in requesting a post office for the name Rochdale, one word, and the postmaster general obliged by appointing William B. Lewis as postmaster on February 3, 1880. However, the Postmaster General named Post Office Langsdale, not Rochdale, as instructed. <clears throat> George Langsdale, who is the Greencastle Postmaster and also publisher of the Greencastle Banner, had intervened and instructed the Postmaster General to name the Post Office Langsdale instead of Rochdale. In an interview, Langsdale stated that the citizens of Rochdale should be honored that the Post Office would have his name saying that the new town would greatly benefit from its influential position. The town's citizens were outraged and immediately instructed the postmaster general to correct this, which he did by renaming the post office Rochdale on February 24, 1880. 
It's important to note the town of Seth was never called Langsdale, only the post office as a result of Langsdale's nefarious efforts. Rochdale was then incorporated on March 25, 1882. Passengers traveling west from Indianapolis and other cities would stop at Rochdale to head north or south on the Louisville, New Albany, and Chicago rail line. Because waits might be long, any amusement offered the passengers was welcome. A large three-story hotel was erected near the intersection of these two railroads. And over time, gambling became a major business, especially for the men. The gaming in Rochdale was not quite on the scale that as French Lick in those days, but it was no penny ante operation. Quite a few establishments operated keno, poker, and various dice games on a grand scale. At the peak of operation, Saturday trains on both railroads brought uh, dozens of passengers from Chicago, Indianapolis, Louisville, whose sole aim was to play at the Rochdale table. The Indianapolis Decatur and Springfield Road was taken over by the Indianapolis Decatur and Western Railroad in March of 1885. By 1895, that rail line was struggling financially and effectively ceased to exist. Lengthy litigations ensued. In July of 1897, the Cincinnati, Hamilton, and Dayton Rail Line Syndicate acquired its assets. The Indianapolis Decatur and Springfield Railroad was taken over by the Indiana, Decatur, and Western Railroad in March of 1885. But by 1894, that rail line was struggling financially and effectively ceased to exist. Lengthy litigation ensued in July of 1897. The Cincinnati, Hamilton, and Dayton Railroad Syndicate acquired its assets. The Cincinnati, Indianapolis, and Western Railroad was established in 1915 as a reorganization of the Cincinnati, Indianapolis, and Western Railroad, which had been created in 1902 as a merger of the Indiana, Decatur, Western Railroad, and Cincinnati, Hamilton, the Indianapolis Railroad. In 1927, the Cincinnati, Indianapolis, and Western Railroad was acquired by the Baltimore and Ohio, the B&O. The B&O was the first common uh, carrier railroad and the oldest railroad in the United States with its first section of the rail line opened in 1830. It, uh, it came into being because mostly the city of Baltimore wanted to compete with the newly constructed Erie Canal. As part of a series of mergers, the B&O is now part of the CXX Transportation Network, and the Putnam County rail lines have been abandoned. On November 25, 1929, a northbound freight train on the Monon had a failure of its brakes and plowed into a westbound passenger train traveling on the B&O, ramming the dining car and injuring seven passengers. Fortunately, there were no fatalities and the injuries were minor. This occurred at Rochdale at the intersection of the two railroads. Raccoon was a community about five miles west of Rochdale at the intersection of US 236 and 231. Originally platted as Lockridge, the railroad had a depot that they called Raccoon Station. At one time, the station manager was Coley Wilson, whose duties include filling the water, the train from, with the water from the water tank. Since had time between trains, with a deep interest in horticulture, began to grow various vegetables at Raccoon Station, experimented with pollinating flowers. Over time, his geraniums became famous worldwide, and he became to be known as the Geranium King. Even his tombstone at the Rochdale Cemetery notes this fact. An excellent article was written by Jana Brothers about Coley Wilson from Malcolm Romine's Rochdale book, which is available at the museum gift shop. The railroad that almost was. Before the Indianapolis, Decatur, and Springfield Railroad was constructed through northern Putnam County, a different east-west railroad was almost built a few miles to the south. The Indiana and Illinois Central Railroad was organized on February 15, 1853 by a company of prominent Indiana promoters, including the governor and several others. During the 1860s, some grade was completed and bridges were being constructed miles in advance of this anticipated railway. Judge Addison Locke Roach was the company's first president. Roach, an oil promoter of railroads, desired a line 
Indianapolis into Central Illinois. The Indiana and Illinois Central Railway became insolvent in 1858 and its assets were auctioned off in September of that year. But in the early 1870, the railroad was resurrected and construction began again. By 1874, the company had liabilities in excess of assets after having laid only 10 miles of track in Indiana from the Illinois line in the Montezuma area, the Indiana and Illinois Central Railroad ceased to exist in 1875. Judge Roach then turned his attention to the Indianapolis Cater and Springfield Railroad, which is the one that went through Roach to later became the BNO, which acquired some of the assets of the defunct Indiana and Illinois Central Railroad. An 1864 map by Putnam County shows the proposed railway was intended to run due east of Groveland into Bainbridge, following the general path of the Ocean to Ocean Highway, now known as Highway 36. In anticipation of the proposed Indiana and Illinois Central Railroad, the taxpayers of Center Township in Marion County agreed to tax themselves a total of $65,000 in 1872 and 1873 so that Indiana and Illinois Central Railroad were built its machine shops in Center Township. The railroad was never completed and the Marion County Commissioners diverted this money to the Marion County General Fund. The funds were used to build a new courthouse the Marion County Courthouse in 1875. And then later that courthouse was replaced by the City County Building in 1962. Litigation ensued and the awarded the Marion County, the Center Township uh, relief. And then it went to the courts in Lafayette where it was slowly died and the Center Township uh, taxpayers never got their money back. So I hope you enjoyed hearing about some of the railroads in Putnam County. Thank you for your time.